People are pretty strange. They keep saying that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all. And yet they just carry on as before. This ongoing irresponsible behavior will no doubt be remembered in history as one of the greatest failures of humankind. If the emissions have to stop, then we must stop the emissions. There are no gray areas when it comes to survival. Either we survive as a civilization or we don't. We have to change. Otherwise, we won't have any future, because that future was sold, so that a small number of people could make unimaginable amounts of money. Did you hear what I just said? Is my English OK? Is my microphone on? Can you hear me? Because I'm beginning to wonder. Can you hear me? Inspired by Greta Thunberg's urgent question, can you hear me, that she put forward in a speech in the House of Parliament in London in April 2019, the project We Hear You, a Climate Archive, strives to amplify and to record for future generations the ways that today's young people are emotionally experiencing the climate crisis. We Hear You, a Climate Archive, grows from the performance We Hear You, the speeches of Greta Thunberg, originally presented at Dramaten in Stockholm in January 2020. The performance drew on the text of Greta's speeches collected in the book No One Is Too Small To Make A Difference. Following its launch in Washington in March 2022 at the Kennedy Center, the We Hear You, A Climate Archive project will commission 77 additional stories from young people around the world. These commissions will include the launch of a digital platform for these climate stories and will culminate in a performance at Dramaten in 2024. You're asking me what the first sign was? Me, a biologist, well, I'd say it was the crows. No doubt about it. Don't underestimate those crows, I always say. I meant it as a joke from the beginning, but the way things turned out, I guess it wasn't really funny at all. What do we know about crows? We know that they're smart, as birds go. They can figure things out. They can adapt to new situations. So. I noticed this coven of crows that had settled on an island quite close to the mainland. There were sheep on the island that had been ferried out there to graze. Somehow the crows had come to understand that the eyes of these sheep were extremely nutritious. They started pecking out the sheep's eyes, blinding them. The farmers saw what was going on and decided to shoot the crows to spare the sheep. In their minds, these crows were evil creatures acting in an, a natural way. The farmers didn't understand that nature in itself cannot be evil. Nature is just nature, being nature. And when conditions change in nature, nature's creatures change to adapt. Only human bias can judge nature to be good or evil. Our species likes to see nature as serving humankind, as humankind's slave. It isn't that way at all. We are in fact slaves of nature. 
Nature must follow the law of nature. That's why it's called the law of nature. So there we were, a small group of biologists and ornithologists, and we decided that we needed to protect these innocent crows. We rode out to the island on the morning they planned to shoot the birds and chained ourselves to some trees. On night two, I left three comrades on the island and rode back to the mainland myself. The damn thing was, I still had the keys to the locks in my pocket. I discovered that first thing the next morning. When we rode back out, we found our colleagues, each chained to a tree. Yes, alive, but without eyes. Yeah. Well, yes, I do blame myself. Being honest, considering what happened out there, it's hard to maintain the idea that nature is without blame. But I still insist that it isn't the bird's fault. Not really. There is a causal relationship here, which cannot be understood in terms of a greater meaning. When conditions change, they sometimes change so slowly that it is first when we are faced with the consequences of what has happened over time that we understand the significance of it. Did this really happen in real life? Well, it could have. But I'm not really a biologist. I'm just a student with a very vivid imagination, I guess. My name is Julia, but everyone calls me the butterfly. Because one day, I flew up a redwood tree and stayed there for 738 days. I named the tree Luna, which means moon, because this tree is so high that when I climb all the way to the top of it, I feel like I could touch the moon. I decided to live in this tree to protect these giants among trees, and it soon became a widespread story of a tree, a woman, and the struggle to save these primeval forests. It succeeded to some extent, but I didn't do it alone. I got unexpected help from forest workers, environmental activists, of course, and many other people, and together we negotiated a refuge, not only for this tree, a thousand-year-old tree, but for several square kilometers of similar trees. There are only 3% left of these primeval forests on Earth, so I really had no choice. I had to do something. When I first entered the land of the redwood forest, I knew in my heart that I belonged there. I fell on my knees in front of the tallest tree and began to cry because I was so overwhelmed by the wisdom, energy, and the soul of this temple. I kicked off my shoes and climbed as high as I could. I had no immediate plan. People shouted that I should climb down and calm down, but I was already calm, calmer than I had been in my whole life. I stayed up there. After a while, my friends understood that I was serious, so they started bringing me presents, food, water, clothes, a sleeping bag. After two years, I came down again. I then had a hard time walking on level ground. 
I still have a hard time sitting on a chair or lying in a bed. It doesn't feel natural. I grew up in a deeply religious family, and when I was very young, I was seriously injured in a car accident. I hovered for a long time between life and death, and when I finally managed to return to life, I had plenty of time, I had had plenty of time to think about what I wanted to do with my life and what was important. I underwent a metamorphosis. That's why my friends call me the butterfly. When I sat up there in the tree and looked down at the world, I really wondered what was happening down there. All these people running around, lost with their mobile phones, on their ways to jobs they don't like. They're driven into a consumption that destroys this planet. You don't need much when you live in a tree. When I finally came down, I was invited to tell about my story, about my experiences from organizations all over the world. It was an encounter with a world that is experiencing great pain. People demanded my help with everything possible just because they thought that I had all the answers. They wanted me to save the animals, nature, mediate peace between people. I gave them everything I had. The price became too high for me. I couldn't just give and give. I finally missed living up there among the rustling treetops, the solitude, the stillness. I've now decided to return to the forest. So I beg you, don't contact me anymore with questions between heaven and earth. I'm no longer Julia living in a tree. I'm about to turn again, transform. I just don't know into what. I cannot help you. It's too much of a responsibility for an individual to bear. I really cannot save you. I'm just a witness to what's going on, what's happening to you, to this planet. Mm, my story? So... I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but if I were to ever tell a story, this is the story that I would share. The theme would have to be something about knowing that you're going to be okay or something like that. So this story is about how I knew I was going to be okay entering the real world after university. It was my senior year, second semester, so close to graduating. It was spring, it was beautiful outside. I had my window open. I was on the second floor, uh, and you could kind of walk out onto the roof over the patio from my window. And I'm sitting on my bed, finishing up some homework, and I just happened to look up at this moment, and I... I see this guy riding a bike past the window. And I, I, I look again, and I step toward the window, and then I even step out onto the roof, and I'm like, oh my god, that's my bike. And I look around the side of the house, and my, my bike is gone. S so I, I, I run downstairs. Barefoot, <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I grab my my roommate's bike. Uh, I start pedaling down the street toward this guy. 
My adrenaline is out the roof. I have no idea what I'm going to say. And honestly, I have a terrible potty mouth. I curse all the time. But in this moment, for some reason, I, I didn't curse. I just pedaled down the street. I stopped this guy and I'm just like, hey, give me back my bike. And he looks very... <laughs> puzzled and, and confused, and he's like, uh, 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 oh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I had to use it to, to uh, uh, and I was like, uh, all these things, and I was like, I don't care, just give me my bike right now. And so he, you know, he, he gets off the bike, and he, he like awkwardly hands it to me, and I very awkwardly try to get off the bike that I'm currently on and I start walking back down the street with these two bikes and no shoes. And he just looks at me and he's like, um, do you need some help? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, actually that would be really nice if you could help me. <laughs> so this gentleman rode my bike back with me to my house. We, we returned both bikes. I put them inside this time. And, and I was like, well, where do you need to go? Where, where were you trying to get to? And I ended up taking him to wherever it was he needed to go. Yeah. So that was the story. And, and after that, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to be okay in this world. It, it reminded me that even in a moment of crisis, you can still find humanity. And I got my bike back. I don't know what to say, really. I'll just stand here for a while. Every time I try to express my feelings, my mind just goes blank. It's so incredibly difficult to absorb what's happening in the world right now. We all know that the climate crisis is the fatal, fateful issue of our times. At the same time, it's so difficult to understand. You know, the sky may be blue, in the winter we may ski, in the summer we swim in the sea, Many things haven't changed that much since we were kids. At least not on the surface. We humans are very good at reacting to immediate danger. Reflexes protect us. But we have a harder time defending ourselves against slow disasters. The danger that the climate crisis confronts us with is of a completely different kind than we are used to. It's a real challenge for all of us. It's a bit like standing on a track with your back to the train. The train is closing in inch by inch, but we are occupied with more immediate things. We risk not noticing the danger until it's too late. I think we expect this crisis to kick in the door, so to speak. But what is really happening is many small incidents. More and more people want to have a bigger and bigger bite of a cake that is rapidly growing smaller. We'll see wars, conflicts, a fight for land in Europe and in many other places. Flooding, hurricanes, expensive food, gas and oil prices rising, precious water. We'll try to keep these events separated as they didn't have anything to do with each other. But in fact, they are interlinked. The thing is, the climate crisis is a chain of events. That's the kind of crisis we're talking about. It's a crisis that can't be resolved by buying a new electric car. 
I think that our belief in science will be our downfall in the end. That's what I wanted to say. Did you hear me? Ha, ha, ha.